Hello everyone, I'm Brother Chad. Welcome to the Master's Lanterns Ministries Online Bible Study. I want to thank you for tuning in and encourage you if you haven't been sharing the videos, please do that. Uh, if you haven't given our Facebook page a like, uh, then you can go to facebook.com slash Master's Lanterns Ministries. That's all one word, Master's Lanterns Ministries. <clears throat> if you'd like to email us with questions or comments, uh, please feel free also to do that. The email is masterslanterns at gmail.com. Uh, I want to personally thank you guys for, uh, for watching these videos. I do not always enjoy making them, but I do know they have been of some help to some people. And they've been encouraging to some people. In this month of October, I'm doing a series of videos because it's the 498th anniversary, October 31st of 2015 is the 498th anniversary uh, of Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the church doors in Wittenberg, Germany. Uh, so it's the 498th anniversary of the Reformation of the Church. And, you know, we've covered a lot of ground, we've made a lot of mistakes, um, but... Uh, you know what we need to keep that fire alive we need to keep going on you know there was a there was an old saying by the reformers and it was ecclesium reformata est semper reformanda that's latin and what it means is a reformed church is always reforming you see the reformers always believed that we would never attain perfection here on earth but that we were always going to need to be we were always going to need to be reforming ourselves and our churches. Uh, and it seems that a lot of the time, the, especially churches which claim to be Reformation churches uh, or Reformed, they think the reforming is complete. The Reformers never believed that. Um, they believed that as time went on, new heresies or old heresies would sneak back into the church and there would have to be reform constantly going on. And today we've pretty much given up on that idea. So anyway, we looked. Uh, we're looking each week at a different one of the Reformation solas. This week, I want to look. I was actually debating when I was uh, when I knew what I was going to teach on. I was debating what aspect to take with this uh, because I already knew. Sola Scriptura was going to go to William Tyndale. For today, we are going to be looking at a verse of scripture. And I'm going to be telling you about the life of the one who really was the Martin Luther of the English Reformation. Or maybe he was more of the John Wycliffe of the English... Well, no, John Wycliffe himself was English, wasn't he? Hmm. Well, anyway, we're going to look at the man who got the, the English Reformation really started. And uh, I decided, after study, we're going to go and we're going to look at the passage of Scripture that won this man over to Christ. And we're going to be looking at the doctrine of Solus Christus. That's one of the five Reformation solas. The five Reformation solas are Sola Scriptura, meaning Scripture alone. And that, doesn't, that just means Scripture alone is the final and highest authority. Uh, sola gratia, which is uh, by grace alone, and that is how we are saved. Sola fide, by faith alone, the, method, the vehicle by which God's grace works to save us. Sola cri solus Christus, which is Christ alone. And soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. So if you have your Bibles, um, I want you to go ahead and open them up with me. We're going to be looking at 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 Timothy 1.15. Okay. And in 1 Timothy 1.15 it says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Uh, 
Thomas Bilney was born in 1495. He was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. He was, like most others, very aware of their sin. And it tormented him. He went to confession often. Uh, he spent much money on uh, indulgences and pardons, uh, masses, things like that. He ended up going to Trinity Hall in Cambridge University, and he majored in canon law while at Trinity Hall. While he was there, Erasmus had released his Greek edition of the New Testament. It was later to be known as the Textus Receptus, or Received Text. But up and but at the point it was released, it was just known as Erasmus's Greek New Testament. Um, at this time, it was not allowed for people to have an English translation of the Holy Scriptures, but Latin was allowed. You were not even allowed to read the Scriptures. Unless it was in Latin, you were not allowed to recite scriptures, prayers, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, unless it was in Latin. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church had a, a, had a very strong hold on its people. And the Protestant Reformation was all about breaking that hold, which it did successfully. But one thing that happened was the Greek New Testament of Erasmus had started causing a lot of things to happen. Uh, it really kicked off Reformation in people's hearts first. And what happens in the heart will radiate outward. So, while in Cambridge, the Greek New Testament of Erasmus was outlawed. Um, and it was once again, oh no, you could only read the Bible in Latin. Um, but it was different reading it in the original language and not just in Jerome's Latin Vulgate. So Thomas Bilney began uh, saving his money and he got himself a black market illegal copy of Erasmus's Greek New Testament. The text we read earlier, 1 Timothy 1.15 as uh, Bilney began reading his New Testament, he came across that passage. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He read that and he stopped. Conviction fell over him because he knew he was a sinner. But reading this verse... For the first time, he was exposed to the fact that Christ alone could save a sinner. Not just forgive him, but save him. To deliver him. To make him a new creation. Immediately upon reading this, he fell under great conviction and cried out to the Lord to save him. And he was saved. His life was radically transformed. He began frequenting a place called the White Horse Inn. Um, that's a place you're going to hear a lot of when you talk about the Reformation. The White Horse Inn, um, this to the side a little bit. Okay, the White Horse Inn was a pub, and uh, during, well, after 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church doors in Wittenberg, uh, when his writings started to appear in England. The White Horse Inn was a place that was frequented by all the scholars and stuff like that. And they were always talking about Dr. Luther. They were talking about his ideas, his writings, his publications, uh, things he had said, things they had recorded. Um, not with an audio recorder, of course, but by hand. And uh, things started to change. The, the White Horse Inn uh, was 
began being called Little Germany because there was so much talk about Martin Luther and all he had been doing in Germany to fight off the, the tyrannical hold of Rome on the people. So as these scholars would meet there and discuss things, you know, it was during this time, Bilney had frequented there. And one day he brought in, that you know, they always talked about Erasmus's Greek New Testament, but now that it was blacklisted, now that it was banned, nobody wanted to talk publicly about having it, or, and not even that many people had one that were going there. Uh, many of them probably turned their copies in if they did have one. But Bilney, just for giggles, apparently, he took his Greek New Testament of Erasmus into the White Horse Inn and said, Come on, y'all! And they started reading it. And he had become a Christian already. And they just started reading the Greek New Testament. And they started making their own little translations of it verse by verse and discussing uh, you know, what was being said in the Scriptures, the Word of Christ. Uh, and, and this began really, uh, you know, if... If, uh, if John Wycliffe was the spark of the British Reformation, the English Reformation of the Church, um, then the Greek New Testament of Erasmus was the, uh, was the kindling. And uh, Bilney would have been like the oxygen, the accelerant to really get it going. Um, so anyway, he took, it, he took his Greek New Testament there for discussion. Um, and all of a sudden, several of the lecturers, the people who gave the lectures, the professors at Cambridge, started coming to the White Horse Inn because word got around that Bilney had a New Testament, and they came to discuss it and read it for themselves. Um, there was a group that were there that would come and discuss things with Bilney. Um... A few, and a few of these people got saved, and of this group, two men who had been exposed to Scripture and were saved, uh, they were born again by the Spirit of God, two of these men became archbishops in the Roman Catholic Church, and they actually worked within the church to help bring about some reforms, and they were very strong in the Reformation. Um, it also brought about eight martyrs, or eight men who died for their testimony regarding scripture, including the great William Tyndale, who was the first person to break the law and translate the Greek New Testament into English without a license. Of course, he had to go to Germany to do that, but he still did it nonetheless. Um, in 1527, Thomas Bilney, for his efforts, his speaking about Reformation, uh, possessing the Greek New Testament of Erasmus and other things, uh, it was in 1527 he was arrested and taken to the Tower of London. Um, he was always being threatened um, and also encouraged by friends. Uh, but on December 7th, 1527, he signed an adjuration. In other words, he signed a paper which was a denial of everything he had believed and taught. Uh, it was very, very difficult for him. But anyway, the next day on December 8, 1527, he walked to St. Paul's Cathedral through the public, through those whom he knew, and they knew him, um, and he was taken there by guard. And while he was outside of St. Paul's Cathedral, I believe that's what I said, wasn't it? Because I'm going off my notes. Yeah. Okay. While he was outside of St. Paul's Cathedral, a man came and preached an outdoor sermon denouncing the heresy of uh, Bilney. And then, at the end of the sermon, there was a big pile of William Tyndale New Testaments. And Bilney was given a torch. And after they had read his adjuration and 
preach this sermon denouncing his heresy, he took this torch and he set this pile of William Tyndale New Testaments into English on fire. Um, he was tormented by this. He was absolutely outraged uh, internally. He was just so distraught over this. What had he done? Um, he had turned his back on his faith. He had departed from that which he believed. Uh, he had become an apostate, in essence. And it was at this very moment he decided to get arrested again and to preach the gospel of Christ again. And he returned to Norwich, England. And that is exactly what he did in 1531. Um, he was rearrested in Norwich for Reformation talk. Imagine that. <clears throat> and then he was taken back to London and tried there. Um, while he was tried in London, he was sentenced to be executed, and that was to be done in Norwich. So, after his trial was over, which of course was a kangaroo court, um, everything was predetermined, and of course Bilney knew this, and he, he was very open, and this is what he wanted. He, uh, he was sent back to Norwich, which is where he was the most influential. This is where his friends were. This is where uh, those whom he had taught Reformation stuff to lived. So he was taken back there, and on August 8th, 1531, it was his last night on earth. Friends came in to comfort him, including a couple of his friends which were still in the priesthood, and they tried comforting him about how the grace of God would overcome the flames, and the flames would be but temporary, and, uh, and how uh, he would only have to endure pain for a time, but then he would be in eternity, and he should be of good heart and strong and stout and that kind of stuff. And uh, he had been reading the scripture until they came, and he had his dinner with them. And when he had finished his dinner, and they were done, he walked over to where he had been reading his Bible. And he opened it up to a passage he had been reading, Isaiah 43, verse 2. And he rested his, his elbow, his arm, on the table or whatever, and he took his finger and he stuck it right in the flame of the candle. And as his finger burned in the flame of the candle, he didn't flinch. He didn't scream out in pain. He just stood there as it burned. And as it burned, he pointed with his other hand, and he read Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. His friends looked there with amazement. He was not in any pain. He read that scripture and when he finally pulled his finger out, there was nothing there but the bone. Um, they were absolutely amazed by this. So anyway, uh, on August 9th, he was being taken to where he would be executed. And he could see the stake at Lollard's Pit. He ran to the stake, and he actually embraced it. He wrapped his arms around it. And there they burned him alive. They tied him to the stake and burned him alive. Dr. Ken Connolly said this about uh, Thomas Bilney. I think Ken Connolly just died a couple years ago, I'm not exactly sure. But anyway, this is what Dr. Ken Connolly said. He said, 
First he taught the reformers how to live. Then he taught them how to die. Sure enough, that's exactly what Thomas Bilney did. In his life, he was a picture of a redeemed man. In his death, he was off to meet his Christ, his Savior, his groom, because he knew he was the bride of Christ. Here's a man that turned apostate and repented and came back to the Lord. His faith cost him his life, but Christ was worth it. As one of the reformers said, just as they were about to be executed, and I believe they were burning him alive too, burning him at the stake, he shouted out, and this is not Thomas Bilney, this is a different reformer, but he shouted out, None but Christ! None but Christ! And Christ alone. And that is the story of Thomas Bilney. Tortured by his sin, got a hold of a Greek New Testament, read it, came to a single verse, and learned that Christ came to save sinners. And he found the love and mercy of Christ given to him by grace, freely, through faith. And then he took possession of Christ. He took possession of the salvation found in Christ. And his life was completely rearranged. And then as a humble servant of Christ, he lived his life. Giving to the poor. Helping whoever he could, wherever he could, to find Christ. And his punishment for this was to be publicly denounced, ridiculed, mocked, and then burned at the stake. It's a sad thing. But that's what Christ came to do. He came to save sinners. It doesn't say that he came to make us wealthy. It doesn't say that he came to make us healthy. It does not say that he came to give us whatever our hearts desire. It says he came to save us. Only Christ could do that. He didn't come to save us from having a bad day or save us from a heartbreak. He came to save us from the flames of hell. He came to save us and make us new men. And as one commentator I remember reading said, If you are saved, what are you saved to? For if you are saved, you must be saved from something. And if you are saved from something, you must be saved to something else. Therefore, when a sinner be saved, he is saved twice. He is saved from something to something. Um, and I'm, of course, paraphrasing and doctoring that up a little bit. But that's a good way of looking at it. Has Christ saved you? If he has, then you must be saved from something, and you must be saved to something. When you are saved, you are saved from the penalty of sin, the judgment and wrath of God, who is absolutely holy. But you are also saved to something. You are saved to the mercy and the love of God. You are saved from being the enemy of God, and you are saved to being the friend of God. And when you are saved, you become a new creation. The things you once loved, like sin, become that which you now hate. And the things that you once hated, like holiness, you now love. You are regenerated. You become a brand new creature. And only Christ could do that to a person. And I encourage you that if you claim to be a Christian, and there's no evidence of that in your life, and you're living a relatively normal life like anyone else, and you don't really care that much about the Bible or the things of God, I might suggest to you that you do not know Christ. And I would also suggest that you would get to know Christ alone, laying aside your good works, laying aside anything that might become that, that might come between you and He. I encourage you to open up your Bible to 1 John, where John wrote about what it is to be a Christian. Compare yourself to what Scripture says. And if you are 
finding yourself lacking, then I would say get on your knees. Turn from that. Turn to Christ. And cry out for Him to save you. Because that's what He does. He saves sinners. And if you're saved from being a sinner, you're saved to being a saint. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're automatically going to stop sinning. But what it does mean is that you begin a new life. And you have the life of Christ imparted to you. You're given the Holy Spirit. You're given the Holy Spirit to empower you to live the life Christ desires. Um, and I think that's about all we're going to have for today. This is a pretty short one, isn't it? But anyway, that's what Christ does when He saves someone. Uh, if you would like to learn more about the Reformation. Uh, because these videos are just going to be a couple of brief snippets about church history. But if you want to learn more about the Reformation, I would really encourage you. Uh, there's a book. It's only $6.99 retail. You can find it at christianbook.com for like three or four bucks. And I'm sure it's even cheaper on Amazon. Because it, oh, it, it's probably cheaper on Amazon. It's published by Spire Publishing. Um, it is edited by W. Grinton Berry. It is Fox's Book of Martyrs. Here's the cover of it for you to check out. Anyway, this is the uh, W. Grinton Berry edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a super thick book. It's just a small paperback. But, uh, in fact, it's only about 408 pages. 408 and a half. So... It's not a long book because it is pretty small, but if you want to learn more about church history, if you want to learn more about the Reformation, if you want to learn more about what it is to be a Christian, this is a book you need to get. In this month of October, I plan on reading this book this month, um, which I'm recording this ahead of time because I am going in for uh, more surgery. I have to get a couple more teeth removed, which is going to be painful. So I'm recording a few videos ahead of time in case uh, I'm not up to recording later on. Anyway, uh, get yourself a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And most importantly, make sure you're in the Word of God. Make sure you are reading Scripture alone as your final authority. Make sure you are trusting in Christ alone for your salvation and sanctification. I'm Brother Chad. For Masters Lanterns Ministries, if you'd like to contact us, the email address is masterslanterns at gmail.com. Uh, you can visit us on Facebook. Our website is, uh, or our Facebook page is facebook.com slash masterslanternsministries. Um, please feel free to distribute the videos however you wish. Uh, give us a like on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to us on uh, YouTube, whichever you want. I'm Brother Chad. I hope you have a. I hope you enjoyed this short video and presentation. Uh, but until next time, I'm out of here. God bless and have a great day.